Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Channel 781 News City Council debrief. Uh, this week in the City Council committee meetings, a lot happened. We have a lot to talk about. Um, in the long-term debt committee, they moved forward the rail trail project. In licenses and franchises, they had people from Brandeis there to talk about the issues that were brought up with housing at Brandeis. In the finance committee, they moved forward the mayor's request for ARPA funds. In the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting, they had a discussion about recording and captioning meetings. In the Council of the Whole, they had a very lengthy discussion about defining and enforcing single family zoning. And so we'll talk about all of those things. I'm here with Chris Gamble. Hello. And James Kreekellis. Hello, everyone. And before we go into those topics, there's a few things we're not going to cover in detail, but we thought we should mention. One is the Public Works and Public Safety Committee did meet, um, and they asked the wires department to come in next time to talk about the issue of blackouts on the south side. Another thing that happened last week was the sale of the farm was completed. So uh, Waltham completed the process of buying from the state of Massachusetts, the former UMass field site, which is now known as Waltham Community Farm. Um, so that's a big step forward in a long process that allows the city to keep that operating as a farm indefinitely, which is great news. Uh, in not so great news, the little queer library again had books taken, um, a large number of books taken at once, apparently by the same person um, who did it the previous time. Uh, some information was gathered that allowed the police to get in touch with this person and they recovered some of the books. So if you'd like more information on that, check out Little Queer Library on Facebook because they are posting about it. Another interesting thing that happened last week, Councillor Paz and Debbie Coleman, who's the new member of the school committee, uh, co-hosted a town hall around the issue of broadband and uh, getting everyone in Waltham access to the internet. And in particular, the idea of maybe having the city be the internet provider, which would guarantee universal access for students and maybe also get us some better rates. So the Waltham News Tribune did a good article on that. So if you're looking for more info on that, I, I recommend their article. So going back to this week in the city committees, let's start with long-term debt. Uh, Chris, can you tell us what happened in long-term debt? No, is that backwards? That's James. So long-term debt, that was, uh, they uh, were discussing two things. One was the uh, fire truck, which got approved, and the other was the rail trail, which also got approved. This is just a section of the rail trail that's going through um, Waltham, and it's a, the one from uh, Main Street to uh, uh, Beaver Street, which with the parts of the, uh, it that already exists, I guess would allow you to go from like Linden Street or Lyman Street, I guess, to uh, Beaver Brook Reservation on bike, which is pretty cool. We talked about the rail trail in the last debrief, and if you're curious about uh, the project, I thought this community meeting that just happened that's on Waltham Data's YouTube page was a great overview. Um, uh, Catherine Cagle, who um, is heading the project, uh, answers a lot of um, introductory questions. Um, so if you're curious, you should watch the video. Great. Thank you, Chris. And uh, James, can you tell us about licenses and franchises? So there was a, a lodging house that got renewed along with uh, some other routine uh, license renewals. And uh, what was notable was that uh, Brandeis had sent a delegation to talk with uh, the uh, Ward 7 counselor about the uh, issues that had been getting brought forward by the, some of the students. And they talked a bit about mold and talked about their testing capabilities and tried to assure the council that they are very proactive on these things. And tried to offer some explanations about like mitigating circumstances like the fact that they weren't uh that they were closed for a long period of time and that there was like some severe flooding that year but mostly just reassurances and the council trying to like let them know that they take this serious or the uh the council letting them know that they take it they're taking this more seriously and the, the um uh, administrative staff trying to make it make assure the council that they're doing their jobs so so we don't have, we had the, the student journalist from Brandeis on a previous show, we don't have them here tonight, but James, if you were a student watching that meeting, would you feel reassured, do you think? There was one part that was a little unclear to me what they were trying to get at, because they were, when they were discussing like a water issue, they said that uh, 
they hadn't received any reports from students on that and that it was uh, and then they when they were talking about some of the mitigating circumstances they were talking about like the, the flushing of the pipes related to the building being um, uh, closed for a period, prolonged period of time and I'm not entirely clear because that's more like lead and like or not lead but like you know, mineral buildup and stuff and the, what the issue that they were describing was that there was like soap or like some kind of like uh, something like that in the water so that wasn't really clear but I think I'd still be a little annoyed if I was a student. Moving on to the finance committee uh, Chris can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah so interesting to me um, in the finance committee was the continuation of the ARPA funds um, we talked about this at the last debrief I've mentioned that I didn't think Waltham was being as transparent as other cities were and how they were spending um, their ARPA funds, which is um, COVID-19 relief uh, money from the government. Um, and so I said last week that maybe in this committee, they would go in depth about what project, uh, like what the money was being spent on. And I gave them the benefit of the doubt, like, okay, like they weren't transparent in the communication, maybe in the committee, they'll talk about it. So I went to the committee um, and what had happened was that not only was basically no questions asked, but the clerk of the committee um, essentially said that they didn't even know what they were going to spend the money on, most of the money on. They were just going to approve the money and then they were going to uh, buy uh, this, the state's requirement use it for four different purposes and only those four purposes but they were essentially just approving money without even knowing what it was going to go towards and i just think that uh, you know it's just hilarious to me the the myth of the financial watchdogs of, of waltham and also just in general um this myth of frugality in the municipal government because just in this mass meeting more than a million dollars was spent on the um spent on uh, the fire department. And you know, I've heard, you know, our fire department's awesome. Uh, I have no complaints about them at all, but more than a million dollars was allocated and almost no questions were asked um, towards them about, you know, if, is there a cheaper option for any of this? And so it's just, you know, I, I've sat in many meetings where a lot of useful things were talked about and the idea of where is this money coming from and it was too expensive was brought up. And just, you know, it's just a myth, you know, it's just, if, you know, I just I'm just dissatisfied with the idea of uh, of financial watchdogs of all them. Uh, so uh, to give an example of what I think you mean, when the uh, armory housing project was being discussed last year, it was either four or five million dollars of CPC money that was being asked for, and there were a lot of meetings about it, and it ultimately didn't end up happening. And there were a lot of people talking about, well, we we need housing, but we need to do it right. This is a lot of money and we need to do it right. But it sounds like what you're saying is they just approved $6 million without asking what it was for. Is that right? Yes, that is exactly what happened. And that's a good example of uh, just, you know, a comparison. You know, the, the city's budget reflects their values and what they spend money on reflects the values. So it's, it's um, you know, what gets scrutiny and what doesn't speaks a lot. Any comments on that, James? Yeah, I mean, I, I commented on this the last time this the, the ARPA funding, but it's just like it, it's a little disappointing, but not surprising when you compare like how clear it is, like what's money getting spent on other cities or small town. And considering like the projects that it could be getting spent on like i think the, i think i think it, the municipal broadband is one that it could potentially be getting spent on you know it would be good to at least spell it out so people have an idea of like what to be pulling for okay so moving on to a uh, issue that uh is very important to me which is the issue of recording and captioning all meetings which is being discussed in the economic and community development committee and the last time um, they met, we uh, told you that, you know, they all seemed very serious about making this happen uh, soon. They, even if it meant the city council had to pay for it out of their own budget and that they had to use a vendor other than WCAC to do it. Um, so that meeting was encouraging, but they didn't end with any kind of concrete plan or next steps. So last week we saw on the city of Waltham Facebook page, there's a job ad posted for two part-time videographers, specifically for Monday nights. 
Um, so I thought that was great news that I thought they moved forward really quickly after that meeting um, towards hiring people. So in the meeting um, last night, I wasn't there, but Chris recorded it for us. Uh, it turned out that actually none of the counselors were aware of how that ad got posted. So obviously someone in City Hall approved it because it was on the official Facebook, uh, but they weren't aware of it. And the WCAC director was there to answer questions for them and she wasn't aware of it either. And she actually seemed kind of annoyed that it had happened. Um, so it's an interesting maybe uh, lack of communication between the executive and legislative branches of our government going on here, but it does seem to still be moving in the right direction. So that's good news. Um, so I wanted to talk a little more though about the questions they asked her. Um, so the WCAC had sent the counselors um, a letter that's sort of laid out the issues of recording all the meetings and gave a quote and that letter is not public. So I don't know exactly what was in it but they had questions for her. In the meeting, um, the director of WCAC was there um, and the counselors asked a number of questions about what would be involved in recording all the meetings. Um, she, let me back up. So the director of WCAC said that she was not aware that they had uh, posted a job ad for this and she was really concerned about it because she had concerns about who was going to supervise these people, were they going to be using her equipment and was that covered by her insurance, um, which is all uh, valid concerns and the um, counselors didn't have answers for that because they weren't aware of it either. So they asked her some questions and I was specifically interested in the questions they were asking her about captioning. Um, because to me, that's that's a big issue. I, I've We've been talking, um, I've been trying since last fall to draw attention to the fact that they don't have, they don't caption the content that's on their website and that's a problem. They're required by law, by the ADA to do that. Apparently there was a $20,000 quote in that letter for captioning. So one of the counselors asked her, um, so 20,000, you know, that's for the captioning, right? And she said, but what we look into is most cable companies already do that. So people have those TVs at home. It would just be an extra thing that we need to do, but we're pretty sure it's already done. So I think what she's saying is that many people, if they're watching WCAC on their actual TV over cable, the cable has an auto captioning service. So she's saying she thinks that's already done. And so then the counselor asked her, but what about um, your content online? Is that captioned? And she said, I don't think so. So that was a little bit frustrating uh, because she didn't seem to be sure of the answer to the question of whether they were captioned, let alone why aren't they captioned. One of the big costs that she talked about was server space. And she said, if they record more meetings, they need to pay for more server space. Well, one of the counselors asked, have you thought about there? Isn't there some less expensive way to do this? For instance, have you thought about putting the shows on YouTube, cross posting them to YouTube because then the storage would be free. And her answer was, maybe we should, but do you want that information out there for anyone to grab and take a hold of? That's the question. So yes, we do want that information out there. It's public information, it's a public meeting, and that is the job of a public access station is to put that information out there. It was an interesting answer because uh, if, the, if you were to cross post them on YouTube, they would both get auto captioned and it would solve their issue of storage space. Her response to the counselor was, if we were to put them on YouTube, we would still have to put them on our server in order for them to go out on the air. So it doesn't really solve that question. But she didn't address the caption issue. The director said to the counselors, you know, we really need to get in a meeting. We really, we really need to talk because maybe we don't need to, they don't need to hire additional staff. Maybe my staff can do this. We just need to have a talk about how many hours it's really going to take, which was kind of odd because they've been discussing this for months and it's not, you can, you're, you're talking about specific scheduled meetings. So it, it's not really that hard to calculate how many hours are going to be needed. And then after she said that, she gave them a handout, which she had made that had two other towns, cable stations, and a list of what meetings they cover and what meetings they don't.
So she was asking to meet with them in private to work it out, but it sounds like what she really wanted to do was talk them out of it because she's giving them this handout to make the point that it's not reasonable for her staff to be expected to cover all the meetings. Um, so my opinion after seeing this is that whoever uh, did an end run around WCAC and the council and city hall did the right thing. Um, I don't think that, I think that she expressed a real negative attitude toward uh, providing access to the public. Chris, do you have any thoughts on this? I think I have um, four thoughts on this. Um, the first, uh, picking up where you left off, um, I'm not sure if it's exactly, um, if I'm if I'm feeling as negative about the prospects, but I was, it was illuminating to realize that they're basically at square one. She was talking about, yeah, we need to get in a room together to talk about if this is possible. It's like, yeah, yes, you do. You've been, this is, and you said this has been going on for months. No, this has been going on for at least six years. And that is, that is the first time I know that they started talking about this. So like, yeah, you should be getting into a room. It took you six years to get to, the, to realizing that we should probably talk in a room together. What I thought was interesting that you didn't bring up was that George Darcy, the Ward 3 counselor, brought up um, the fact that she, he ran the numbers in real time. She was talking about like how many hours is actually this is gonna take. Well, he listed the four committees that are going to be need to be recorded a year. And he figured out that including, you know, all the vacation time that they have, it would be 21 meetings a year that need to be recorded. And so that's like 80 something meetings. And then he said, let's bump it up to a hundred. So a hundred hours needs to be spent a year on this. And if you're paying someone $25 an hour, that's $2,500. You know, we're talking about uh, frugality in the local government. And essentially we've been talking six years, trying to figure out where we can spend, how we can spend $2,500. Two other thoughts. Uh, I found some of her answers just bizarre. Just like some of the things that she was saying was bizarre. She said that the new SCC director um, didn't believe in free speech. And so she was in favor of shutting down local access. Maybe that last bit is true, but I couldn't find anything about the sitting SEC chair not believing in free speech. I think what she's referring to is Jessica Rosenworcel, who I just learned existed yesterday. I couldn't find anything about that. Um, I, I found know. something on that, Chris. So I'm yeah, if you, if you want to talk for a minute about- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, this was actually an interesting part. So she talked a little about what she's dealing with as a public access person, and this is all true. She's funded by the cable companies. They want to give as little money as possible. And in fact, they're lobbying FCC to no longer require them to have public access channels at all. So if that were to happen, she would not only lose her funding, she'd lose her channel. Um, and so that's a big issue that I'm glad she brought up because I do, public access is really important and there is a movement to save it. And I support that. What was weird about her, oh, so the, the reason she brought up the FCC director was because there were some Congress, there were some Democratic people in Congress, this is at the federal level, who wanted to bring back an old FCC policy that Ronald Reagan got rid of called the Fairness Doctrine, which basically the FCC had the ability to enforce fairness in news. And some Republican members of Congress were very upset about this because they see the Fairness Doctrine as um, inconsistent with free speech. And I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to try to explain why now because it's, it's more involved. But basically, when this new FCC director was getting confirmed, they wanted her to state clearly that she was against bringing back the fairness doctrine, and she wouldn't do that. So they say she's against free speech. Um, but that has nothing to do with public access because the fairness doctrine never applied to public access. So even if they brought it back, it probably wouldn't. And it sounded like the director was saying that, you know, because this FCC director um, opposed, uh, was liked the fair, was maybe in favor of the fairness doctrine, that meant she was more likely to shut down public access. I don't, I don't really buy that. Um, but it was an especially an odd thing to say in context because the council was asking her to do something that would make her more valuable to the community, and they were talking about paying for it. They were asking for her, for a quote. They weren't insisting that she do it out of her own budget. So they're offering her a chance to make herself more relevant and get more money, and she's saying, I can't do that because people perceive us as irrelevant, so we're getting less money. And that didn't make sense to me as a reason not to do it. 
Yeah, that was just bizarre. And I don't know, I've never, I've, ne I've never seen this person speak. I've done work with Little Plaxis before, but I've never met the director, never saw her speak. And it was just bizarre to me. Uh, the final point I'll make is one on, um, you know, going back to transparency, but I was blown away that the director of local access and then also the council had no idea about this job posting that the city of Waltham put out for these things. And that just blows me away. And it goes back and back and back to the fact that there is no city planning in this city of Waltham. And the mayor is just allowed to just do whatever she wants. And I wouldn't be surprised if she has some kind of project where she's going to record them herself and uh, with city money and then just put it on, put it online. Uh, but there is no communication. There is no collaboration and it's it happens time and time again if if it was her idea to just go ahead and make this happen i appreciate that but it, it was a little embarrassing that the city council didn't know about it yes yeah yeah joey brought up the fact that you know he had to make a bunch of calls and like figure out what the hell was going on when he was leading this committee trying to do that exact thing and there was no communication so definitely understand his frustrations James, did you have any comments on this? I only got to see a bit of the meeting, but I, I, it's always it's like a little striking that someone who's like, you mentioned already the pushback she gave on the, like the idea of uploading these videos for everyone to see that like that lack of interest in like, I guess what the core mission of the, of the, the company is combined with them not wanting to then seize on an opportunity to like, you know, one, make money and two, provide that service. I guess it's not that surprising she wasn't that interested in that. What, so it's just like, it raises the question of like, why are we working with them in the first place if they don't seem that interested in the very job that they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, I agree. The ACE and WCAC stands for access and it didn't seem like access is something she, she really cares a lot about. So, with that, let's move on so the, to the Committee of the Whole. So there was a very interesting discussion in the Committee of the Whole. Um, it was a long discussion. It went about 100 minutes. Um, and this was, as you'll remember uh, from last week, um, Councillor Durkee uh, put forth a resolution which was co-sponsored by most of the councillors um, about clarifying the definition of single family housing. So they had the city solicitor in and Councillor Durkee asked him basically to clarify um, single family housing. So he uh, cited some case law, both from the US Supreme Court and the Mass um, Supreme Judicial Court, which basically said that um, cities have pretty wide authority to define uh, a family, a single family housing that the Supreme Court had a ruling where they said that a single family neighborhood is a sanctuary. That's the word they used, a sacred space. And anything that could mess up that sanctuary, that could create instability, as I think another word they use, is, is incompatible with a single family home. So basically what he was saying, so, so Councillor Durkee brought up an example, which he brought up last week, where there was a house, it had four bedrooms, it was renovated to have six, and then it was being advertised as a rental for 12 people. So if I understand what the solicitor said, you can't do that, that is not allowed. So you can't um, rent a, a, a single family home out to multiple unrelated people. So what the counselors wanted to know is why isn't that enforced? Because in addition to that example, they all had lots of examples of multiple unrelated people living in a single family home. And the answer was that the building commissioner is in charge of enforcing it, and he wasn't there. Um, so that the lawyer couldn't really answer questions about the enforcement, but they were all prepared to ask that. So they went around and most of the counselors made comments in they, which they brought up some examples of how the quality of life of people who own single family homes is being, uh, damaged by the behavior of renters, particularly college students. And they all had several examples of this and they wanted to know how it could be enforced better and the lawyer couldn't quite answer that, although they did have some discussion of ways they could change the ordinance. 
At first, it was a really confusing conversation. It seemed like they weren't understanding each other. Uh, Councillor McMenamin then spoke and she kind of got it on track because she kind of articulated what the other counselors were trying to ask, which is how do we enforce this better? Um, but in the process of doing that, she said she made a number of comments that would, would take us a long time to, to unpack. Um, she said that we have too many group homes um, and Walt Hammond implied that those are a liability for single family um, neighborhoods, even though they are specifically allowed in single family neighborhoods, that's an exception in the law. She accused uh, renters in a certain neighborhood of vandalizing the vehicles of owners who had complained about their behavior. She also made a comment that when she started as a counselor in the 70s, a family was defined as a, having a mother and a father. And that was completely irrelevant because it, it had already been clarified how that's defined now. Um, so there was no reason for her to bring that up. Um, so it was interesting. She kind of saved the meeting, but she also said a bunch of things that, that you know, to me maybe hinted at some really ugly attitudes. And so overall, we learned a little bit about single family zoning, but overall it was a long discussion of counselors expressing negativity towards renters and especially college students. And counselor Lefauci seemed like he had been prepared to rebuke um, somebody. And since the building commissioner wasn't there, he gave the same kind of rebuke to the lawyer about the poor enforcement. And in the process of that, he said that universities contribute nothing to the city. University students, he said, contribute nothing to the city, which was an interesting comment because they're talking about students who are renting private homes and then those landlords are paying taxes. Whereas if they rented on campus, the university doesn't pay taxes. But beyond that, he more deeply, it was, the attitude was expressed multiple times that universities are not part of our community and they don't contribute to anything in our community. The one person who sort of challenged that was Councillor Cates. He pointed out that it, the students are not the bad guys, it's the landlords who are renting to students who are violating the law and it's much more practical to go after them than go after the students. Councillor Paz also made a comment about we could develop a relationship with the university to solve these kind of problems, which is what most cities with universities do. They have someone in City Hall who's a liaison to the university. Um, but that's, that's it for, I've said enough about my summary. Chris, Chris what was your take on this? I'm going to give it to James first. Um, yeah, go ahead, James. It was a good summary. Uh, <laughs> some of the things that jumped out to me was uh, the and it wasn't just it, it was Dunn, Katz, and uh, Lafoci in particular, but a number of counselors were very interested in pursuing a line of questioning around how to do preemptive enforcement and. The Fauci specifically bringing up, like, if there's any way that they could be going to the schools to be collecting lists of students to then cross reference to then, like, I guess, try to find some way to penalize them, which strikes me as a little, little heavy handed. And it, it was pretty, it, the uh, solicitor seemed pretty interested in sort of diverting them back to talking about what the existing enforcement methods are and spent a number of times clarifying that it isn't actually a, a pretty large amount of money that ends up getting billed to these landlords if it gets enforced. And that like creating some new enforcement isn't ne strictly necessary. And just a lot, in the vein of like <laughs> complaining about students and stuff, it, uh, some very disproportionate responses were getting proposed like I think it was O'Brien who specifically brought up like wanting to see students getting expelled for being rude to homeowners uh, among other things it's, and also just the language surrounding all this stuff I mean it's legalese but it's very um, you know, traditional concepts of family and talking about groups of unrelated people and then with counselors talking about like invasions of groups of unrelated people it makes it sound like this is like yeah it, it definitely paints a picture of how they perceive this and then at yeah. the same time complaining about how little these renters are contributing when as we discussed in our last last episode like rental properties and stuff are not as tax advantaged as owner occupied single families are and proportionally are probably contributing more and 
or at least are not benefiting as much from existing as are not benefiting as much from the sort of the current tax structure as homeowners in you know, owner occupied buildings are. That's kind of my, my first pass. And, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, all of these examples that they bring up, you know, as long as wages don't go up and things cost more money, working class people are going to get more creative with housing. Uh, I think it was Anthony uh, Lafauci in, in Ward 1 talking about, uh, very true, about how, you know, you get three friends and you put them into a three bedroom and then you take the dining room, that turns into a bedroom, living room, that turns into a bedroom. I've been in those situations. I'm not going to say it won't happen again before, before I die, but it's just that's what makes things cheap. That is how people, some people get by. And as long as, you know, people aren't making more money working most jobs, then people will get creative. So things like this will pop up more often. Um, and uh, the, only, the only other comment you both uh, talk very well about this um, is that I thought Kathleen um, brought up a good point that the universities, you know, share some blame in the sense that if they have, and this is not an accurate number, but if they have 3,000 uh, dormitories and 5,000 students, then they're going to be pushed out into the community. And so uh, something that should be talked about more is pressuring the universities to build more affordable housing on their campus. Yeah, actually, uh, let me talk a little bit about more because one thing I meant to mention in my initial summary, another theme that kept coming up was they kept implying that Brandeis and Bentley are not responsive to these needs at all. And um, people from Brandeis were there though, they were in the prior meeting. Uh, so it, it, was, it was like they, they came in with a script saying that Brandeis was not responsive and they didn't want to change it just because people from Brandeis were actually there. Um, but there's a lot of things a community can get from a university. And um, they did bring up the point, like Chris said, of is, you know, is the number of students they admit based on the number of house, uh, the amount of housing they have, or are they forcing some students to live in the town? And, th and the answer is almost certainly that they're forcing students to live in the town. That's what most universities do. They admit more students than they have housing for. And in Boston and Cambridge, that's an issue. And Boston and Cambridge push those universities and they build more dorms and they're always building more dorms. Um, and I believe Brandeis is building more dorms now. Councillor LeBlanc asked to have the presidents of Brandeis and Bentley come to a future meeting to discuss this. And it's a good idea to discuss this with them. And uh, LeBlanc also asked a question about, can we ask the universities to pay us money in lieu of the taxes they don't pay? And the answer is yes, that does happen. I like, for example, Harvard pays money to Cambridge, but Harvard is a very conspicuously wealthy institution. Um, so that would be a big can of worms if they're going to bring that up with the, the university presidents. But the other thing is there's so much a university can give a community. They could get send people to help out with education in the schools. They can have events on their campus. There are so many ways that the universities could give back to the community, but there was such a clearly expressed attitude at this meeting that the universities are not part of the community, that they're a liability. So if I were the president of Brandeis or Bentley, what is there to negotiate? If you're talking to people who see you as a liability, where do you start to build a good relationship there? I'll just say this meeting was a good example of why it can be really hard for new people um, to get involved because it was a very long, very complicated meeting. The language was used was very complicated. And, but more to the point, it was a hundred minutes of the interests of single family homeowners and how they're being damaged by everybody else. And that's what the city council spends a lot of time on. So I hope people who are new to the process get that point that um, the city council discusses a lot of different issues, but some of their longest discussions are things where they're really only talking about the, the needs of owners. Is that fair to say, Chris? I'd say that's pretty accurate. I would agree as well. In, in it's not unique to have a meeting where it's entirely centering single family homeowners specifically, but this was definitely a, uh, this was definitely a long one. 
Yeah, yeah. The, so, the, the counselors talk about things that they get feedback on. And while city government and municipal politics is dominated by homeowners, this is what we're going to talk about. So um, I would love to see more working class people, more renters engage in the municipal process of uh, municipal government. And then we could actually talk about more interesting things to me. Yeah, and actually what something I should have mentioned, it seemed like that resolution was prompted by a ward meeting that Councillor Durkee did where, where the people in his ward brought up these issues. And Councillor McManaman says she was physically there. I don't know why she kept saying she was physically there. I don't know why she, she, she wasn't Perfect spiritually over. there. Uh, yeah, exactly. She kept saying, no, but anyways, the, the counselors were very aware of this meeting and they, they were very aware that people were going to be watching to see how they brought up the issues that were brought up in that meeting. So non-homeowners can also hold a ward meeting and bring up issues and then watch the meeting to follow up and see if they, so, so maybe that's what we need to do. All right, I think that's everything for tonight. This was a very busy week and a lot to tackle. Uh, thank you very much, Chris and James. Thank you. Thank you.